All right, good evening. Uh, so our first week uh, in Lent, we talked about how when Jesus was raised from the dead, it kind of shocked everybody. Uh, that if you were to survey the uh, beliefs about who the Messiah would be, literally none of them say that the Messiah would die. Uh, and especially, you would find that none of them would expect the Messiah to be raised from the dead. Uh, and what we concluded, ultimately, was that, uh, first off, the disciples had no incentive to invent a resurrection, uh, to kind of come up with this idea of, you know what, he really was the Messiah, he was raised from the dead, because nobody was expecting it. Uh, and uh, secondly, what we kind of came down to uh, was the fact that, that Jesus being raised from the dead is the center of Christian hope. Then when we talk about, you know, what's the point in being a Christian, uh, what does it do for you, what is your hope, ultimately it finds its way in and through this cataclysmic moment when God raised Jesus from the dead. So the question is, well, what does that mean? Last week, we talked about how uh, when Paul talks about heaven and our relation to heaven, it's not about us going to heaven, but rather heaven coming down to us. Uh, and then furthermore, we talked about how when Jesus returns, or at least when Paul talks about Jesus returning, uh, and he comes like riding on the clouds or something like that, we all go up to meet him but with the idea that we actually return to earth. So this uh, surprising, kind of startling idea that actually heaven is not our home. We are human beings, and God created the earth to be where we live. This is our home. And that could be kind of an uncomfortable fact, because uh, often uh, when you think about, like, okay, what do Christians believe about hope or life after death or something like that, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, we believe that if you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven when you die, when in reality, the New Testament doesn't talk like that. It talks about new creation and resurrection. So tonight, we're going to ask about bodies. W what happens with, like, my body when I die, and, and especially looking ahead to uh, this moment sometime in the future when God raises everybody from the dead. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about the new heavens and new earth, and we'll start to bring it together. And then the final two weeks, we'll ask the question, yes, yeah, so what? Why should I care? All right, so we have 1 Corinthians 15, and I invite you to turn to it uh, in your bulletin, or if you brought a Bible or something like that, that's good too. Paul says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come, or with what kind of body do they come? That's honestly a good question, even though he's going to call that person foolish. Uh, if, if I'm going to be raised from the dead, I want the body I had when I was 21 not like when I'm 75 or something like that, please. Uh, but what Paul is actually saying here in his response is like, I think that's the wrong question. That's a category mistake. So he says, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. That's actually a bit of imagery Jesus uses. Like a seed goes into the ground and it dies and it splits apart and then something comes out of it that is new. Uh, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. Now, just fair warning, this gets really dense. We're not going to be able to pick it all apart. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. So he's he, he's hinting, I think, at the fact that whatever we are now, we're like a seed or a kernel, and we will go into our graves, and it's like we are being planted. And when God raises the dead, what comes out of it is something connected to what was, but also somehow made new. And so when you sow the body, what you get is a body. 
So that's why he's saying like fish have their own thing, birds have their own thing, humans have their own thing. We will remain human. Uh, verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of, heaven, of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. Something I want to point out there, the earthly and the heavenly both have glory. That would have been a very weird kind of subversive thing for Paul to say to a group of mostly Greek-minded people. Because in the ancient world, or at least among the Greeks and the Romans, the flesh, the body stuff, the physical matter was seen as lesser. Uh, and, and your goal as a human being was to transcend that, to be above and beyond the physical stuff, to ascend you know, the planes of existence or something like that. Uh, we actually often have that same idea. Because sometimes we'll talk about, you know, there's our life. And yeah, that's important. But what about my spiritual life? As though those are two different things. When we separate those out, we're not really walking in the categories of the New Testament anymore, and certainly not with Paul. But his point here is that they still have their own kind of glory. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from Star, four star differs from star in glory. I think that's because they shine differently. Otherwise, I don't claim to understand that section. So it is with the, or so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. This body is definitely perishable. And the older I get, the more it reminds me that it is perishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. This body is prone to sin. I regularly and, with, with, uh, and I'm fabulously adept at it, uh, at, at operating outside of what God wants for me. We would call that sin. Uh, it is also weak. I cannot prevent myself from getting sick very easily. I, I cannot stop myself from doing the things I don't want to do, and I keep doing the things that, I, uh, that I'm trying to avoid. Like, like, this body is stuck because we live in an existence that is prone to decay. To quote the great, the great poet Yeats, things fall apart. It is sown a natural body. This body, as he calls it, is a natural body. This, like a seed, will go into the ground waiting for God to raise the dead. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam that would be Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. So again, the, things like this where you go, Paul, hold on, slow down. You're getting us mixed up here. So th this raises a question. What is the difference between a natural body and a spiritual body? Because, hey, Eric, you just said that we don't really... Uh, draw a line between like my natural or physical life and my spiritual life. Like I thought you said that the way of Jesus is kind of an integrated whole thing. And that is correct. That is what I said. And that's actually what Paul means. But, but our English translations kind of miss it or it, it's, it's hard to see. So, so I have an example, another example from the same book, which is important in 1 Corinthians 2. It's on the other page. Now, it, we're not going to get caught up in what Paul is saying. The point here is that Paul is going to use those same two words, but in a different context. And that helps you to understand what Paul means when he uses those words. So the word for natural or natural body is psychikos. You can hear like psyche or psychology or something like that. And the word for spiritual or spiritual body that Paul uses there is pneumatikos. 
If you're a, a tradesman of some kind, you may know about pneumatic tools. They are air powered. That's where that word comes from. So the question then is, how is Paul using these two words? So he says in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Okay, so Paul, what do you mean by that? The natural person, that psukikos, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So in other words, when Paul says the natural, the psukikos, he doesn't mean like the physical stuff as opposed to the spiritual stuff. He just means the thing that is not interested in following Jesus. Whereas when he uses the word spiritual, he's actually talking about those who are caught up in this story of redemption and resurrection, who are kind of caught up in this story of Christian resurrection hope. So question, what is, and there's only one example, what is the example of what will happen to our bodies, us, who we really truly are, when God raises us from the dead? What is our only example of what that would look like? Yeah, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead. And his body, his resurrected body, was physical. One of my favorite resurrection scenes is Jesus is over on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And what is he doing? He's making breakfast, like you do. He, he still has these scars. So there's some kind of continuity, like, like what I will be when God raises me from the dead will somehow resemble or be related to what I am now. But I will be made complete my heart, which is broken and sinful and frankly kind of disgusting, will be whole. And I will live a full, truly human, resurrected life. Because our hope for our bodies is not that we escape this physical matter, but that actually God makes his creation, including me and you as human beings, whole. And now I'll turn it over to you uh, at your tables to then follow up with these questions, hope and your future.